today well today is the last day of our homes at home series and I just used a little internet magic there to get us started but I want to say welcome thank you if you tune in all five, five days this is the fifth day of our five day homes at home webinar series we're so glad you could join us again with Michigan Sea Grant to learn a little bit more about how you can engage with the Great Lakes at your own home we've had four awesome videos already and four great challenges if you haven't seen them yet, and this is your first one, feel free to head over to the Michigan Sea Grant website, michiganseagrant.org, and go to the programs under Homes at Homes. You're gonna find all our previous videos on there, closed captions, all the challenges, so you can get yourself caught up. But today we're diving into a brand new topic that I'm really excited. We're gonna talk about the winds and the waters of the Great Lakes, the lake effect. So I'm gonna use a little handy dandy video sharing here and before we dive into the reminder of our five great lakes i just want to review with you uh, or share with you how is it that we monitor the winds and the waves in the great lakes hmm so any guesses out there how do you think people monitor the winds and the waves how do we measure them we can go out and look and be like, oh, it's really windy out, or there's lots of waves, but how can we actually get some numbers and some scientific data? Any guesses at home as to what that might be? You might be able to tell the person next to you or shout out. Maybe you've heard of the weather service before, or weather system, but I wanna share with you a really cool service out there that the government provides called the Great Lakes Observation System. This is a whole series of really fancy technologies that have been out there since the 1970s to help us measure the wind and the waves and the temperature and so many things about the Great Lakes. It's an international effort between Canada and the US with the USGS and they have these amazing things like these gliders. Do you see that picture there? That's a drone that glides along the water and gets all sorts of really cool data. We have satellites that can tell us about algal blooms and models, which are computer models, where you can predict when things will happen, like predict the future. But one I really want to share with you are the buoys. We have a buoy system across the Great Lakes with these awesome solar panels. You can see those different uh, wind things up there at the top to monitor wind. But one of the amazing things, these can measure at the actual heights of the waves. And so that brings us to the Great Lakes poster. We're gonna go through the Great Lakes and learn what the highest wave was ever measured on each of the Great Lakes. So uh, let's go through the Great Lakes. I want you to shout out the names of home. Hopefully you still remember that acronym, HOMES, H-O-E-H-O-M-E-S. I know how to spell. HOMES, uh, each letter stands for one of the Great Lakes. So, Let's start with the Great Lake uh, right here. This is the shallowest Great Lake. And even though it might be the smallest amount of volume, it still has pretty big waves. Can anyone shout out the name of this lake? Lake Erie. Hopefully we got some Ohioans tuning in or some Ontarians who might live on that lake. Uh, but Lake Erie is a great lake. Now, how high do you think the highest wave ever recorded by the buoys was there? Hmm. Would you realize that it might be 13 feet high? Holy moly, 13 feet high wave. That's like two and a half of me stacked on top of myself, coming at you in a giant wave. That's a really big wave. So 13 feet is the highest wave on Lake Erie. Now the next highest, uh, next lake with, we're gonna look at with a high wave. This is our namesake lake. Chicago's down here at the bottom not too far from Grand Rapids and a bunch of great Wisconsin cities. This is Lake, shout it out, Michigan. Lake Michigan. So the highest wave ever on Lake Michigan in 2011, recorded by a buoy, was 23 feet. 23 feet, that's so big. 
That's like taller than a giraffe. Can you imagine the biggest giraffe you've ever seen? That's how high that wave was recorded on the Great Lakes. 23 feet. Quite incredible. All right, headed down. We're going to do the next two lakes, which have almost the same highest uh, recorded. This one here. With, uh, a whole bunch of great stuff going on there. <laughs> Lake Ontario. These two lakes have had waves as high as almost 25 feet. 25 foot wave. Can you imagine a school bus and then you took it and you tipped it upright so it was standing up and then turned that into a wave? That's how high that wave would be. That's a huge wave, 25 feet. But that doesn't even get us to the biggest lake of all that's had the biggest waves. Now, you may have heard of the Ed wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, where some of those waves were predicted to be even crazier higher, but the highest wave recorded by the buoys was just back in 2017. Any guesses as to what name of that lake is? It's Lake Superior. All right, so the um, highest wave ever on Lake Superior was 30 feet. 30 feet, 30 feet, that's almost three stories high. That's a huge wave. So there are some massive waves that come across the Great Lakes. Pretty cool facts out there, folks. I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about some waves that you should and the wind and the waves. It's all connected out there. Um, so let's head back to our little presentation here <coughs> and take a look at some of the other crazy waves. So we do get really big waves from storms that just build up, like the ones I just told you about, those massive waves. But there are some super special waves and some currents that also can form in the Great Lakes. And so, some of those other Great Lake waves um, actually come from our major winds. So the winds in the Great Lakes go from east to west from over by Wisconsin out all the way towards the East Coast. And that can create a special thing called rip currents, which is something everyone who swims in the Great Lakes should know about. People that swim in the oceans know about them because they happen there too, but lots of people don't know that rip currents actually happen in the Great Lakes. So a rip current is when all the wind is blowing onto shore. These happen a lot on Lake Michigan. Those currents are so strong that Olympic swimmers can't even swim against them. They're that strong. So if you ever get caught in a rip current, first, what you want to do is three simple things. Just flip, float, and follow. So I got my little guy here. If you ever get caught in a current, what you want to do is just flip up on your back, float, and follow. Let the current take you away. Again, flip, float, and follow. <coughs> and then you're out of that current. Once you're out of the current, you can swim to the left or the right, and you can get back to shore. Never try to swim against that current, though. <coughs> That's only going to cause problems. All right. So, uh, if you want to know if rip currents are happening, head to the weather, uh, National Weather Service website, weather.gov slash Great Lakes slash Beach Hazards, where they can tell you if there's a high risk for rip currents in your area, and so you can know before you go. That's one of the best things you can do. All right, some other cool different types of waves that occur in the Great Lakes. Did you know we have tsunamis in the Great Lakes? Meteo tsunamis or meteo tsunamis. These are not tsunamis caused by earthquakes. They don't get many of those, but they're caused by thunderstorms or some kind of crazy weather event that's ripping across the lake. And what it actually does is cause <coughs> the waves, the lake, to get unbalanced. And all of a sudden, a big whiplash can happen and a huge wave can come in. Here's a picture. These are two pictures from just an hour apart in Ludington where you can see that the waves uh, came up over seven feet over the pier here in Ludington. And then afterwards, all the way back down eight feet. Pretty crazy. 
Another thing is called a seish that can happen. That's when the winds are just blowing really steady and pretty much just blow the water in a steady way across the lake. And after a while, it might slosh back the other way. This is like if you're in your bathtub or you're carrying a thing of water, it's just sloshing back and forth bigger and bigger. These are rare events too, but they can happen. So the whole point of this is to just know before you go in the Great Lakes. It's a great place to go swimming, but you want to make sure that you check those weather websites and that you check the beach hazard website to make sure that it's safe before you head out there. They're pretty awesome and powerful events, though, if you do get to see one. All right. I'm going to share with you another pretty neat uh, way that we measure the weather in the Great Lakes. This is from my friends over at the Weather Service in Gaylord, Michigan. And these folks are going to tell us a little bit of how, how the Weather Service and the Doppler radar stations work and how they help us monitor the Great Lakes is the Doppler radar, or as many folks refer to it as, the giant soccer ball. The Doppler radar stands nearly 125 feet tall and is built to withstand 150 mile per hour winds. Inside the ball is a large satellite dish which is turning all the time, 24 hours a day. It does a complete 360 degree revolution at an elevation of a half degree, then tilts up a little bit and makes another revolution. It does this until the last and highest elevation turn is made before dropping back down to the half degree elevation for another round of revolutions. This whole process from the half degree elevation sweep to the highest elevation sweep is called a volume scan. Now the radar works by sending out pulses of energy during each turn and then waits to see if it hits anything such as raindrops, snowflakes, and hail. If it does hit something, some of the energy is sent back to the radar. The amount of energy returned is calculated as well as the amount of time it took to make it back. This data is then processed at the buildings beneath the radar and then sent into the actual National Weather Service building to be processed again and ultimately displayed at our workstations. We can then determine the intensity of the precipitation and the distance the precipitation is away from the radar which could be as far as 150 miles away. What makes the Doppler radar so special is that it can see the motion of the precipitation within the thunderstorms, which is also the air. It's not a very toward wave radar, and this is for other severe storms. What may not be as well known is that the Doppler radar can be set in different modes. For instance, we can make the radar take additional 360 degree sweeps in the volume scan in order to dissect the atmosphere or storms in greater detail. Another interesting thing about the Doppler radar is that it can be set to a very sensitive mode which can actually detect dust and other particulates in the atmosphere, insects, migrating birds, and converging areas of wind such as lake breezes, which are so common here in northern Michigan. The National Weather Service's Doppler radars were positioned strategically across the country to provide the greatest amount of radar coverage for the United States population. And not so surprisingly, these Doppler radar positions are also where most of the National Weather Service offices are located. Wow, that was really, really neat. The Doppler radar network is pretty amazing. And do you know, if you pull up the weather app on your phone or you turn on the news to watch the weather, all the data that they're using comes from the NOAA Weather Service. They're the only Doppler radar system out there. And so all these other places and people are getting this information and it's being used super helpful to help you know how to plan your day. Kids, if you are about to go outside and you see it sunny, you're like, let's go to the beach. And your parents are like, no, I know the future. It's going to rain later today. They know the future because that Doppler radar is out there. All right. So I'm going to show you, we learned a couple different ways today to measure different weather and water in the Great Lakes. We learned about the loss system and the buoys that are out there. We learned about the Doppler radar from the Weather Service. And I'm going to show you now for your challenge today how to measure the weather for yourself at home. We're going to make our own home weather measuring device here. We're going to make a weather vane. So we just need a few simple things here to make our weather vane. The first thing you need is just a piece of cardboard. You also need 
some construction paper or even some box board like a cereal box, a pencil, a straw, a little bit of molding clay, which I'm using Play-Doh because I don't have molding clay, but it'll work just fine, and a pin. Make sure if you're a kid, you're you, with your parents because pins are very sharp and can hurt. So you want to be with your parents for that part. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just cut out a little square here so that we have a base for our weather vane that we're building today. All righty, not too hard. And voila! Now, of course, you can make this fancier than I did and a much better square than I did. You can decorate it however you want. But you want to make sure that you write the four cardinal directions on there. And that means the four different directions. So we're going to put an N for north, an E for east, an S for south, and a W for west. Never eat soggy waffles, right? Because that's just gross. But that's also a way you can remember north, east, east, south, and west. Now that I have my directions on there, the next thing I'm going to do is prep my straw. So all I'm going to do is just take my scissors here and make a little cut on each end of the straw, about a half inch to an inch down the straw, just cutting it in half. Next, I'm taking my construction paper, which I've already cut out a rectangle and a triangle, and I've actually glued two pieces together to make it a little sturdy. Like I said, if you have box board, like a cereal box at home, that works great too. And then I'm just gonna simply slide these into the cuts I made to basically make an arrow. That's pretty cool, I just made an arrow. All right, now down to the last bit here, we're just gonna take my molding clay <laughs> and just form a little blob and just plop it right in the middle there, that's all. Now I'm gonna take my pencil and just jam that right in there. And finally, I'm almost done with my weather vane, believe it or not. The last thing I did to do this part for you, but you wanna stick the pin directly through the straw, right through the middle, and then put that pin into the eraser of your pencil. And now, when I take this outside, when the wind starts blowing, I can know what direction it is. You're gonna to need to go outside with your phone or a compass, and your phone, most smartphones have a compass on them. Figure out which way north is, then place your weather vane on the ground with the end pointing towards the north, and wait to see which way the wind is blowing. That's it, folks, it's that easy, pretty neat. Now make sure you don't leave these outside. These are not permanent outside weather vanes. You don't want that plastic becoming marine debris and ending up in our lakes and streams. But you can take them outside for a while and monitor. Hey, you know, if you don't have molding clay or a cardboard at home, but you got a box, you can just jam that pin right into the box and you're done. In the links, we'll share a couple ways that you can, uh, or a couple instructions that are a little better than what I just did to tell you a little more about how to make your weather vane. So that's your challenge for the day, folks, is to make a weather vane that you can monitor the weather at your own home today. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, I do want to share really quick. If you're like, well, that's pretty cool, but I want to take it up a notch. I want to know how can I make that information useful? Well, you can actually contribute towards the National Weather Science or National Weather Services different citizen science databases. Citizen science, you said? Well, that's where everyday people like you and me can actually do real science and contribute it to different databases that scientists can use. We talked earlier about the eBird database, if you're birding. Well, here's a few of the weather databases that you can contribute to. One of them is the Kukuras system. That's a great name. And this is actually a whole group of people all across the country, actually multiple countries, the Bahamas, really Canada, the US. Uh, they are all out there monitoring rain, sleet, hail, and snow for the web service. All you have to really do is join the network, do a few online trains, and purchase one of those rain gauges you see over there on the side. <coughs> They're about 30 bucks plus shipping. And then you can become an official monitor of rain and snow across uh, wherever you live in your own backyard. And this actually goes into a database that the Weather Service uses to help figure out differences 
uh, and to ground truth some of their models. Pretty awesome. If you want to really take it up another notch, there are actually four different networks, uh, including the Kukuras network, like the Citizen Weather Observer Program, where you can maybe get a little more high tech with an actual weather monitoring station, monitor the wind, the rain, the temp for the weather service, and again, send that in to actually be used by the weather scientists at the NOAA National Weather Service. So with that, again, your challenge though is to just simply go out and make a nice with a little weather vane for your own house. Feel free to get crazy with it though and go on to those different sites. So I hope you enjoyed the Home for Home series. That about wraps us up, but we do have our last Q&A session for today. So <coughs> what questions do we have out there? Hey everybody, this is Geneva. I'm Elliot's coworker at Michigan Sea Grant and I'm coming to you from Ann Arbor. And I've got a bunch of questions from you coming in through the Zoom. If you have questions um, and you're on Facebook, feel free to put those in the comments and we'll get those too and we'll see how many of these we can answer. So Elliot, people are wondering what kinds of severe or big deal storms do we get in the Great Lakes? Do we get hurricanes? Mm. That's a great question. I have to admit, I'm not a weather expert, but I do know a few of the things that my friends over at the Weather Service have taught me. So we don't get hurricanes necessarily in the Great Lakes, but we do get strong storm systems from outside of the Great Lakes regions. In fact, sometimes we even get the leftovers from a hurricane that hit the Great Lakes. And so these very strong systems that might either come down from the Arctic, or from the Gulf or East Coast can bring a lot of moisture and a lot of wind. In fact, we can get winds up to 70 miles an hour out of these out of system storm systems. We can also get something called a squall. And these are actually little storms, but they pop up very fast and then they hit areas really hard with really intense rain. So these are a little more scary because they just pop up out of nowhere and they're a little harder to predict than those big storms, which we normally know are coming. Uh, some of the other crazy things we talked about earlier, the meteor tsunamis, those can kind of come with the squall sometimes, and that can cause a, lit a literal huge wave to move in over the course of 10 minutes to an hour and inundate areas with water. We don't have too many tornadoes, but tornadoes, especially in the lower part of Michigan, can be a big <coughs> uh, risk as well. <coughs> That's just a few of the extreme weather events that we might have. Great, thank you. Is there a time of year when storms like these are more frequent in the Great Lakes? Yes, you may have heard of the gales of November, and you might have gone off and listened to the Gordon Lightfoot song about the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The fall is a very high intensity time for those really high wind events that can have really big waves. Many of those largest waves I talked about measured on the Great Lakes happened in the months of October and November, when we tend to see those really strong wind systems uh, enter the Great Lakes. So that's a really high intensity time. And of course, we also have lake effect snow, which is really special snow we only get in the Great Lakes because it's actually from water that comes off of the Great Lakes, moves onto land, and comes down as snow. It's a very rapid transition, so it's not a big storm that we see coming from miles, hundreds and thousands of miles away. This is just a quick, instant lift of the water and then back down on land. And those happen primarily in December and January when there's no ice on the lakes so that water can still come off. And those can be very intense as well. So speaking of Gordon Lightfoot and everybody's favorite song that will be stuck in many of our heads after this presentation, um, do you know anything about the weather conditions that might have contributed to Edmund Fitzgerald sinking? Mm, that's a great question. You know, I would highly recommend you go online and check out maybe the Whitefish Point Bird or Whitefish Point. Um, Shipwreck Society, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Society based at Whitefish Point, or some of our other um, awesome resources like the Thunder Bay Marine Sanctuary, where they have a lot of more info than I know about shipwrecks. I do know that that shipwreck did happen in the fall, and it was during one of those really high wind events where we get the gales of November, essentially. So this was a fall event, and the waves were extremely high from just this steady, constant wind. This wasn't one of those quick squalls that 
just tears through. This was one of those big, prolonged windfall events that we had. And they predicted that the waves there may have been higher than we've ever even recorded on our buoys, since we didn't have any buoys out where they were at the time. So not very many people got to see whatever waves uh, sank the Edmund Fitzgerald, thankfully. Um, but how about you? Have you ever seen any really huge waves in the Great Lakes? Ooh. You know, I've been lucky that I haven't been stuck out on the water because normally I grew up with a dad who checked the weather before we went out fishing on the Great Lakes. Uh, and I do a lot of kayaking now, but again, if it's too windy, we don't go. So I haven't been stuck on the water with many big uh, wave events, but in 2017, we had the, the record wave on Lake Superior measured out by Marquette. I live in Sault Ste. Marie, and I did manage to see the waves that day. And it was incredible. The spray from those waves was just washing over places you never thought water could get to. Um, the rocks up at Lake uh, Marquette, Black Rocks, those rocks are 15, 20 feet out of the water, and they were just being completely covered by waves. So I've, I've seen some, some pretty big waves, but nothing like what out at the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Great. Hopefully we uh, don't have to get slapped by any big waves this year, especially with the water levels being as high as they are. I know shorelines are even more uh, vulnerable to those kinds of big waves than they would be if the water levels were lower. So moving on from waves, we have a question about ice. So lots of us have seen a small pond or an inland lake that might freeze over from shore to shore. Do the Great Lakes freeze over all the way? That's a great question. So each year it's a little bit different and scientists use satellites typically to monitor how much of the Great Lakes is covered in ice. It really depends on the winter and it depends on the lake. Um, for example, Lake Superior almost never freezes over, but a few winters back we had some really harsh cold winters where the polar vortex kept getting knocked off its orbit and sent down to the Great Lakes. And that winter we had, I think, somewhere around 90% of Lake Superior covered in ice. This winter, I think it was down more like 20% or something, a lot less ice cover. The other lakes, big ones like Michigan and Huron, they typically do freeze pretty far out, miles and miles out. But again, it depends on the winter. They can go from the high 90% to just down in the 20s or 30s as well. And then Lake Erie does tend to freeze over quite a bit um, because it's a little smaller. I'm a little less familiar with Ontario. So it depends on the year, but you can always uh, check out the weather service where they do uh, send those updates as to how much of the lakes are covered by ice. Great. And it's important to remember that if the Great Lakes look icy, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe for you to walk out on them. Can you give us any safety tips for exploring a frozen lake? Yeah, so it is always very important to stay safe on ice and make sure that it's thick enough. There are some great diagrams out there that show you how thick ice needs to be for somebody to walk on it or for you to take a snowmobile out on it. I don't have one of those at hand, but maybe we'll add that up on our website. The other thing that's really important when you're going out on the ice is to make sure you have the right safety equipment, especially if it's thin ice. And if you're a kid, you don't want to test the ice by yourself. You want an adult with experience who might be the one to figure out if the ice is safe or not. You want to go with more than one person because you might drown. And then it's great to have a rope with two uh, picks or two sharp objects at the end that you can quickly use if you do fall through to get back on the ice. So like tent stakes would work well and just tie a rope between them. And if you do fall through, then you have that ability. But Thank if, you. if the big thing is don't go by yourself and don't go out if it doesn't, if you're not sure it's safe. Very true. Because even if something looks like safe conditions, you want to be really, really sure that you know what you're getting into before you walk out there. So we are almost at 11 o'clock. We're going to squeak in uh, just a couple more questions. Elliot, do you have a favorite season? Oh, you know what? 
One of my favorite things about living in the Great Lakes is that we get four seasons. We get all four and that's my favorite thing. I love the change and the starting of something new. And so I get to experience that four times a year in the Great Lakes. I don't have a favorite season. My favorite is when we go from one to the next. I'm super excited right now because although I enjoyed the snow and snowshoeing in the winter, I'm really pumped about the snow leaving so that the birds are arriving. I can get some birding out and start doing a little more hiking around. So I'm, I just love the change of the seasons. And Michigan is one of the best places in the world if you want to really, truly experience all four seasons. You're so right. This is a pretty amazing state. Well, it is 11 o'clock, folks. Thank you so much for all the questions you sent in. There's a very good chance that we're going to use some of these in a question and answer episode coming up sometime soon. So watch our Facebook page uh, for some more news about that in the next couple of weeks. If you have been participating in the challenges this week, we now have a link up on the Homes at Home webpage where you can send in a Google form and let us know that you've done all of the challenges. If you do that, we will send you a certificate saying that you are now a junior Great Lakes scientist. You can see an example of that certificate up on Elliot's screen. And if you send us your name, we'll also add you to the Great Lakes Hall of Science Heroes that will be up on our website. And when we send you the certificate, we'll also get you a link to that so you can see your name loud and proud up on our website. Thank you so much to everyone who participated this week. All of these videos are being archived on our YouTube channel and also on that Homes at Home webpage, which I will make sure to drop into the chat right now. We would love to see pictures of the things that you're working on, so feel free to send anything to us over Facebook or other social media. You can tag us at MIC Grant on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. We are so glad that you joined us this week, and we're hoping to maybe have some more of these episodes coming out in the future. So again, just watch our Facebook page for news about that, and be sure to share these with other people that may not have been able to tune in this week, but might enjoy them moving forward. Thank you so much, Elliot, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you.